Brothers and sisters, early on, God, who created everything, selected one people as a model for the fulfillment of His providence of the human cultivation, and they are the people of Israel. And in the Old Testament is their history. Through their history, God wanted to show to all the peoples in the world His heart and His will. He reveals to us who He is and what He wants from us, human beings. Namely, as we explore how the Israelites received blessings or faced disasters in their relationship with Him, we can exactly figure out God-pleasing will. From today, I will deliver messages based on Senior Pastor's sermon series, The Land Flowing with Milk and Honey, preached back in 2001. These messages are also part of the Israelites' history, and they describe the process of their conquering Canaan, the blessed land, which God promised them. But they are not just the history of Israel, but essential messages for all of us, God's children. Seeing how they conquered Canaan, we can see what could happen in our journey towards heaven and realize what should we what. we should be vigilant against and how we should rely on God in our march of faith. We already are well aware of their process of conquering the Canaan. We know exactly how they took the land. Father God had shown them amazing power. Father God showed them the evidence of uh, guaranteeing Moses. They saw numerous evidences, but Because things didn't agree with their thoughts, they grumbled and complained. Seeing them, we used to think, why did they do so? But we know that it's the heart of the people and hearts of men. As we realize this, we can change ourselves. We may feel frustrated, but we have to know that it's like they are like us. So we we can think about how would Father God would look at us. And Father God, Also, Father God is also giving us message while s e n i n g p a s t o r is not away. Father God is all, also the messages have a lot in common with the fulfillment of Father God's providence regarding this church in the end time. Now is the time to make bread of these words, rely on Father God's promise, and boldly march on with faith. May this message help you examine whether you've been well prepared to conquer the blessed land and help you discover the areas where you fall short. I urge you to find out what you have to do for the conquest of Canaan and make up your mind. So, I hope that each one of you will play major roles in fulfilling Father God's providence and become the pillars of New Jerusalem. As you apply the story of the conquest of Canaan to your life of faith, rather than considering it their own history, you can experience God's work of creating things out of nothing, reviving the dead, and making impossible things possible and miserable situations prosperous. For example, in the next session, I will talk about the ten plagues. Even while the ten plagues Uh, hit Egypt, Father God protected the land of Goshen where the Israelites lived. So we you should make where we should accept this message with faith. Even as God's children, we are protected, but we have to know. what kind of life as we watch their conquest of Canaan as we listen to this message you have to accept it as your faith and apply it to your own life of faith so that you can overcome any kind of tests or trials 
I pray that you will obey this message and accomplish it with your faith so that you can be prosperous in your families, business, and workplaces. You know, this message applies to us. Apply to our taking the land of Canaan. You know, we have to move into a new sanctuary. It can be applied to this. Not just the, the... It tells us how we should overcome the each and every situation. And it tells us, I hope all church members, the church workers and pastors realize this. and apply the message to your work for the kingdom of God. Before the Israelites entered the land of Canaan, they suffered mistreatment and slavery in Egypt for as long as 400 years. Let me briefly explain its background. God started off the human cultivation with Adam. As mentioned earlier, God selected one people as an instrument to proclaim to the world His power and His will, and that He is living. The people started with Abraham. Israel started off with Abraham. God called him, giving him the covenants of blessing, as we find in the Bible. Through Abraham, God gave those words of blessings and I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing as God blessed Abraham God gave him the words of covenant for Israel the Lord appeared to Abraham and said To your descendants, I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. The words were given when Abraham was called by God at age 75, left his home, and settled in Canaan. It's not that he'd grown into a tribe or a people, but God told Abraham in advance that the Israelites would suffer slavery for 400 years and the events to unfold after that. God said to Abraham, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, where they will be enslaved and oppressed for a hundred years. But I will also judge the nation whom they will serve, and afterward they will come out with many possessions. After many years passed, when Abraham turned 100 years old, he gave birth to his son according to God's promise. Abraham's son Isaac gave birth to two twins, Esau and Jacob. As the first son, Esau had a right to receive God's blessing, but he didn't cherish it. Saying that he, saying that he was famished to death, he sold that, sold that blessing for a bowl of stew. which means he didn't cherish his right but neglected it. You may think of Esau as stupid, but you have to think whether you are like Esau. As the Bible says, that there be no immoral or godless person like Esau who sold his own birthright for a single meal. God turned his face away from Esau who acted in godless ways, not longing for spiritual blessings. But even today, we see many of such cases. There are people who don't keep the Sabbath for money, fame, and authority, and those who've abandoned their God-given duties for personal reasons. To abandon, you know, just holding on to the title doesn't mean we keep our duties. If we don't actually carry out the duties, it's like abandoning the duties. They trade, they trade their precious duties for worldly things or for personal feelings. In heaven, they would see how precious their duties are and what a blessing they are. Because they cannot see the rewards right now, they trade it for fleshly things. They are like Esau. 
On the contrary, his brother Jacob had a proper inner heart before God, by which he longed for spiritual blessings and tried to take it by force to the very end. God planned to fulfill His providence through His offspring and refine them for many years. After the trials, He gave him a new name, Israel, and His descendants are the people of Israel, the people of God. But at that point, Jacob's family hadn't grown big enough to set up a nation. Even as they entered Egypt, they were only a family of 70. To make a nation of this small tribe, God proceeded His with God proceeded with His work with wisdom unfathomable by man. God Himself worked to establish a nation. First, God had God had Jacob's eleventh son. Joseph entered Egypt, which was world power at the time, and saved Egypt from a huge disaster through him. Why did God specifically choose Joseph out of Jacob's 12 sons? It was because only Joseph was worthy of carrying out that precious duty. To carry out that precious duty, it required him to go through trials unspeakable with words. Not just anyone can go through that. So that's why a trial is a blessing. If you face a trial, you have to think, Father God is putting me through this trial to make me into a great vessel. But if you complain and grumble, you will fail to receive a blessing. We want to be chosen and used by God. But In order to be chosen and used by God, you know, you can find the answer from today's message. You know, when Father God intends to use a person, He puts him through a harsh trial. Ask yourself, can you, would you be able to go through that? Even when you face a slander and false charges, would you hold on to Father God and keep going? with thanksgiving and joy, not ceasing to pray, without a change of heart? If you do so, you can turn into a vessel, a beautiful vessel, and be preciously used by Him. Such people are like Joseph. God had Joseph sold into slavery and then imprisoned with false accusations. While the Bible says God was with Joseph and made him prosper, but why didn't God protect him? It was because his hardships were part of his plan. I'm talking about God's plan. I'm mentioning the word God's plan uh, repeatedly. We cannot see His plan with our physical eyes and ears. We cannot see His big picture. But it would be a blessing if we could see His plan. But physically, even if if we cannot see His plan right now, if we have evidences, we should hold on to His blessing. I urge you to pray like this. Please, Father, please help me realize your will, realize your plan. This is possible only if your spiritual eyes are open. I'm not talking about just uh, seeing spiritual visions. You should have spiritual awakening. If you have spiritual awakening, you will be joyful and thankful no matter the situation. If you have, through such people, Father God accomplishes His work. And Joseph was like that. And Joseph was under God's plan. But under God's plan, it seemed he seemed to he went through all kinds of trials and was imprisoned. But it turned out that everything was under God's plan. You know that, right? You should have such a spiritual perspective.
If God had protected Joseph, Joseph wouldn't have gone to prison. He wouldn't have been imprisoned. He wouldn't have gone to a prison where king's prisoners were confined. But then, God's great will wouldn't have been accomplished. That's why Father God let him be imprisoned. Father God let that happen so that His will, His providence could be, and that's how He could become a person, the greatest person next to the king, and He could equip Himself with qualities to rule over Egypt. We may think things just happen without our efforts, but you have to know that we cannot Father God does not let us reap without sowing because the enemy devil interferes with us. Father God do things exactly according to His justice. He gives us tremendous blessings only after we pass through trials. Without passing through trials, He doesn't give us blessings. What is important thing is Joseph faithfully carried out his duties. You shouldn't have misunderstanding. You may think, uh, the only thing I have to do is just pray. No, you have to do your work faithfully. Also, while you, while you do your work, you shouldn't deviate from the truth. You know, Joseph came faithfully carried out his duties and he got recognition and he learned how to do things. That's how he could equip himself with qualities to rule over Egypt. You have to apply this to your own life. You may think, I want to be outstanding. I want to stand out among people. Then you should examine whether you live a faithful life. Just living As you please, you cannot expect blessings. If you want to be rich, you should uh, save money. You should have self-control. You should stop doing what you want to do. You have to apply not just about prayer. You should discover where you fall short. When Joseph was first sold as a slave, God had him learn economics, being in charge of all affairs in a big household. After he was in prison on false charges, God had him learn politics, how to deal with people, and many things, like people's falsehood, craftiness, deceiving skills, and tricks. After, when we went through the... the 1999 trials, Sina Pastor mentioned that, you know, there were people, while we went through the trials, there's one thing that Father God wanted to realize. He wanted to realize darkness, evil. You know, suppose a person commits evil against us. When we see evil, We should look at ourselves. We should examine whether we have that kind of evil in us. And in doing so, we should hate evil in us. You know, before we go through trials, we may not realize what kind of evil we have in us. But as we see evil in others, we may discover evil in ourselves, and we begin to hate evil and try to cast it off. As we do so, we can be, make ourselves clean and pure. That's how we... That's the kind of awakening we had uh, while we go through the 1999 trials. But what about the trials recently? When we saw evil and darkness in others, we may... What kind of awakening did you have? when we saw people betraying uh, we should think uh, that's too evil I really hate it I also may have that kind of evil in us and I should pray with tears and comparing ourselves to Sina Pastor how did we do that's how we overcome evil with good 
So Father God allowed Joseph to... And what kind of awakening did you have through the trial? As you have those awakenings, you can have... So going through trial is not harmful. As we go through many things, we can have many awakenings in the truth. And out in the world, we have discernment. But if you have complained or grumbled or judged and condemned others when things uh, didn't agree with your thoughts, Joseph learned many things in the prison and after Joseph became a vessel capable of managing national economy and embracing everything with great love and virtues, God put him in the highest position next to that of the king. We can see that things proceeded exactly according to God's plan. God instantly established him as the leader and had him save Egypt from a huge disaster. Back then, the Near East region suffered a great famine that lasted seven years. Even with advanced civilizations, a seven-year famine would cause tremendous chaos. Uh, You must have watched on television many people famished to death due to long drought and little children who are just skin and bones in Africa. People send relief from all over the world, but the situation is helpless. Without advanced civilizations or technologies, a seven-year famine must have meant death and it could have brought destruction to Egypt, which was a world power. Yet, with God-given wisdom, Joseph knew about the disaster in advance and prepared, thereby saving all Egyptians from it. Being greatly indebted to Joseph, the Egyptian king highly welcomed Joseph's family to move to Egypt. He treated treated them with great hospitality. Thanks to Joseph, even during the seven-year famine, the Israelites could live peacefully being provided with food in Egypt, and they settled down there and multiplied. But later, problems began. After Joseph and the king who was indebted to Joseph died, a new king who didn't remember Joseph's favor ruled Egypt. Since Joseph, the Israelites had multiplied and become great in number. To the new Egyptian king, the Israelites, a foreign people flourished flourishing in his land felt like a threat. That's how he began to persecute the Israelites. He forced them into hard labor, and later he even issued a decree that all newborn male babies be killed. He intended not to allow their descendants to live in the land. As the male babies were to be killed, naturally they would end up with no descendants. God did say that He would make a big nation of the Israelites, but they were in danger of extermination. And Moses, a man of God, was born in that painful and bleak time. According to the king's command, Moses was supposed to be killed as soon as he was born. But God moved the hearts of Moses' parents so that they would hide the baby Moses and let him survive. And amazingly, according to his plan, Moses was raised in the Egyptian palace. Moses' parents secretly hid him for three months, but as they could do so, But as they could no longer do so, they put him in a wicker basket and left it on Nile River. By doing so, they committed things to God. They just left a basket on the river. You know, the basket could have been overturned or Moses could have been killed. The baby Moses... could have been spotted by the Egyptians and could have been killed. So his parents must have prayed, Father God, please save him because they they could no longer keep him in their place. They just left him on the river. 
But the Egyptian princess discovered Moses on the river. She had pity on him, took him to the palace, and raised him as a royal member. As you carefully read the Bible, you can find that God already arranged even small matters before time began. How did Pharaoh's daughter come down to bathe at the river with her maidens and discover the baby Moses right after he was left on the river? And she had a pity on him and she had a, she had a desire to raise him. This all happened by God. Father God moved her heart. You know, she opened the basket and find, found the baby and found the baby crying. And she began to have pity on him. That's how she brought him to the palace. You know, this wasn't a coincidence. Neither was it Moses' luck. Everything had been in God's plan since before time began, and they happened accordingly. What's more amazing is, under God's intervention, Moses' own mother, Moses' own mother, was allowed to raise him as his nurse. It's important for a baby. You know, baby's character is formed by his mother, and his own mother raised him. Suppose he was, suppose Moses was raised by a different woman. How could she have taught him about God the Creator, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? How could she have told him that Moses was an Israelite, not an Egyptian? Only his mother was able to do it, and God had a had a God had. Moses' own mother raised him as his nurse. All this process was never a coincidence, but only possible under the providence of the Almighty God. God saved Moses who would fulfill his providence from death, had him receive good education in Pharaoh's palace, and let him learn about his people and about God in greatest detail from his own mother. Being a prince of the powerful nation, Moses didn't become complacent. Instead, he was concerned about his people's suffering. Meanwhile, he got involved in a big incident. Seeing a Hebrew beaten by an Egyptian, he killed, an, he killed that Egyptian. Even though he was an Egyptian prince, Hebrews were his people. That's why he murdered that Egyptian who bullied his fellow Hebrew. By this incident, Moses had to run away to the wilderness. He lost all the honor as a prince of a powerful nation. There were no more delicacies, no more luxuries. What lay ahead of him was a rough life in the wilderness. All his plans for the future and all the hope he had for his own people were gone. At first, he must have felt so miserable, insecure, and disappointed about his situation. But with passing of time, his pride or his confidence as a prince faded away and he adjusted to his life as an ordinary shepherd. As he adjusted to living his in-laws, he learned to figure out others' feelings and serve them. In doing so, he lowered and shattered himself. It looked like he forgot about his past. In a sense, Moses became totally useless in accomplishing God's work. When he was a prince, at least he was bold and confident. With his authority, he was capable of doing something great for the Israelites. But then, he became a fugitive whose life was being threatened. He was just a worthless man who couldn't do anything for God. But this was under God's plan, and this is His way to refine His man. So if you realize that spiritual principle, you know, when you face the trials, you can just lower yourself. You, you, you don't need to give excuse or complain. Even when you face false charges or face unfair situation, you just keep silent and pray and examine yourself whether you hate others or not. If you discover evil in you, when, you, when people slander you and when people create false rumors, you want to 
argue with them. All this is evil. When we go through trials, we may face such a situation. And when you do so, you have to examine yourself and just pray. and repent of all ill feelings you have to shatter yourself you shouldn't think why am I facing such a difficult situation and why is he giving me a hard time but you have to think because I have a desire to argue with them That's why I have to go through this trial. I have to cast them off. That's how you quickly pass the trial. Otherwise, if you complain and grumble and lose the fullness and stop praying, you may face trial after trial after trial. Some people may completely lose their faith and others, you know, when you go through a trial you have to examine how you feel you have to check whether you put the blame on others if you do so you continue to go through trials and build up the wall of sin but the way to overcome the trials is to look back on yourself and shatter yourself That's how you quickly um, end the trial. Let's take a look at the people of God. You know, David used to be respected by people like Saul had slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. But as Saul got jealous of him, he became a fugitive. Just to save his life, he even pretended to be a madman, drooling. As people belittled him, tried to capture and kill him, and reported his location to the king, he repeatedly had to run away. God made him a worthless man. But through these trials, David achieved profound goodness and a great heart, thereby making his nation rich and strong. The same went for Apostle Paul. He was from a rich and honorable family, entitled to a Roman citizenship. He acquired his knowledge under Gamaliel, one of the greatest teachers. He was a healthy young man who seemed to like nothing. But after he met our Lord, he had to give up all things. He had to give up his honor, didn't exercise his right as a Roman citizenship, and turned all what he learned into nothing. But God didn't stop there. He had him stoned, abandoned, and criticized by his own people. He had him suffer scorn and mistreatment. Even so, Paul didn't get discouraged. He relied more on God and communicated with Him in depth. Receiving power and strength from above, he turned into a person able to do God's work. It's not that he received power from the beginning. As he shattered himself through trials, he got more strength from above. As he suffered many hardships, he prayed all the more fervently and overcame the trials well. So he was given power. But God gave him God gave him a thorn as well. By putting a thorn in his flesh, God prevented him from being arrogant for performing power. So he prayed and humbled himself more, thereby performing greater power. Thanks to such trials, he became a great servant of God's power, carried out his duties well, and finally died a martyr. Thus, all trials and persecutions turned out to be blessings. It was the same with Moses. What we should deeply realize is that God chose him to fulfill his providence not when he was full of pride and a prince, uh, but when he had completely humbled himself as a shepherd in the wilderness. We have to remember this. This is the kind of person God wants. He fulfills His providence through individuals who don't rely on His wisdom and capability but only depend on the Almighty God, shatter their thoughts, and deny themselves and show complete obedience. With man's capability and thoughts, which are the third dimensional, we can neither beat the 
fourth dimensional enemy devil nor fulfill God's providence. So, learning to rely wholly on God requires us to go through trials. We cannot shatter ourselves without uh, trials. We may want to have great faith and we may want to be used greatly by God, but it's only our wish. Only through trials we can shatter ourselves, shatter our ego deep in ourselves. Through trials, we may discover our selfish desire and greed. Discovering that we put ourselves to death and through this process, God lifts us up. Before meeting God, lying on his sick bed for seven years, senior pastor realized He realized that we cannot even keep our own life on our own. He also realized the utter vanity of fleshly love. He learned that the love of parents, brothers and friends and neighbors can change, and they can betray you if things go against their benefit. When happiness in his family, hope for his future, and pride in himself, you know, s e n a Pastor had a nature to plan things perfectly and carry them out. You know, when he was a student, he planned to, he planned what time he would get up. And when he couldn't keep that promise with himself, he disciplined himself. And when he married his wife, he also had a, a bright dreams with his wife. He planned everything perfectly, and he believed in his dream, fulfillment of his dream. But everything fell apart. And he realized that he was nothing. Only then did God reach out to him. After being sick for seven years, he had all that awakening. And he he realized that he couldn't believe in himself. He couldn't believe in anyone. And that's how he only relied on God. God healed him of many diseases in an instant. When he called him to be his servant, s e n i o r pastor had nothing. He didn't have enough money to set up a church and had no preaching skills. He was too old to enter a seminary. Most of all, he lacked memory power to study. He was introverted and too shy, which was a big problem. Even so, God called him and guided him each step of the way, making him Physically, it was impossible, but still, God called him. You know, previously, s i n a p a s t o r had a big dream, but he realized that he couldn't do anything on his own. That's when Father God called him, and as s i n a p a s t o r obeyed, Father God guided him each step of the way and made him a servant of God's power. Also, when God first called him, he commanded something most difficult to obey. That was a financial issue. Uh, Having having been sick for seven years, he had a great amount of debts. He and Mrs. Bong Yim Lee could barely pay the monthly interest with both of their incomes. But God commanded him to stop working, focus on preparing to become a pastor, and have Mrs. Bong Yim Lee work alone. If he did so, God said He would bless them with God bless them with income greater than when they both worked. He said, "If you obey, I'll give you a measure pressed down, shaken together, and running over, so that you you wouldn't run out of rice and money." The senior pastor and Mrs. Bong Yim Lee obeyed accordingly. You may think, Father, if I hear Father God's voice. Directly, I would obey. No. Even even if Father God doesn't directly speak to you, He gave us messages through the Bible. And the problem is, whether you obey or not, because you don't obey, you cannot receive blessings. Some of you may think, Father God didn't... And you may think, if Father God directly speaks to me, I would obey, but no. Father God commanded something difficult to obey to s e n a pastor. But s e n a pastor wholly trusted in God and obeyed. As a result, God blessed them with income a few times greater than when they worked together. That way, they could pay off all debts in a few months. 
That's how they resolved their financial issues. When God called him to be his servant, he also said, Whenever you go, wherever you go, I'll be with you. Wherever you go, whenever you go crossing rivers, mountains, and seas, I will prove that I am with you with, through signs and wonders. And God did just as He said. The reason that all this has been possible is that s i n a Pastor utterly realized the futility of flesh and realized in the depths of his heart that he couldn't do anything. But only God can. So he showed complete obedience. Even in severe trials, he never harbored resentment or lost his faith, but only showed God only demonstrated goodness and love and marched on in faith. Like this, God looks for people of obedience. God is still looking for such people. The Bible says, But God has chosen the foolish foolish things of the world to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong, and the base things of the world and the despised God has chosen the things that are not so that He may nullify the things that are, so that no man may boast before God. Another verse tells us, Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you thinks that he is wise in his age, in this age, he must become foolish, so that he may become wise. Thus, we should quickly shatter all our fleshly thoughts and theories and be able to obey God's will completely. I also urge you to possess spiritual faith of relying on God rather than looking at your reality. Think about this. Am I a person who can do things or not? we should commit things to God whether we can do it or not Father God when we rely only on God's wisdom and His capability Father God looks for such men of, of obedience In order to obey God and fulfill His providence, even Moses needed to go through trials during which he stayed in the wilderness for 40 years and utterly shattered himself. During that time, he deeply realized that he couldn't do anything by his wisdom, capabilities, and ways. As he looked after the ship, he cultivated patience and meekness by which he could harbor millions of people. Only after that did God show up after him. before him. As Moses turned 80 after the 40 years of trial, God called him. Today's passage is God's word to Moses after the trials. Therefore, come now, and I will send you to a Pharaoh, so that you may bring my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt. Even after Moses went away to the wilderness, persecutions against the Israelites and their forced labor had continued. Amidst their hardship, they bitterly lamented and cried out, and and their cry rose up to God. So God decided to save Israel, and to accomplish this task, He showed up before Moses. There were not there weren't just one condition. You know, Moses had to keep himself, and and the Israelites' cry rose up to God. All these, all these things work together. So, there is a... And when the right time came, Moses... But Moses was disturbed. He was a completely powerless shepherd. Even if he was to go back to Egypt, he would have no superb base because it had been 40 years since he left. How could he possibly come before Pharaoh, the king of a powerful nation, and take back the people enslaved by him and his people? There was no way the king would give them up. Also, Moses wasn't certain that the people would trust and follow him. Knowing that Moses had such concerns, God didn't just send him. He told Moses in detail what to tell them. 
God also told him what to say to the Egyptian king, that the king would refuse to let the people go and that he would send down various plagues to move his heart. God even told him that by the time the Israelites left Egypt, the Egyptians would give them articles of silver and articles of gold and clothing. God didn't just promise him with words, but showed him convincing evidences. As, is, as Moses threw his staff according to God's command, it became a serpent. As Moses grabbed the serpent by its tail, it turned into the staff. Also, as Moses put his hand into his bosom and took it out, it was leprous like snow. But as he put his hand into his bosom again and took it out, it was fully restored. After he heard the words of God and witnessed these signs, he only obeyed God's word. And, holding his staff, he departed for Egypt. Spiritually, the staff means faith. You know, people with weak legs depend on a cane in walking. Likewise, even when something seems impossible with our own own capability, if we have faith in the Almighty God, we are more than able to make it possible. Because Moses knew well about his shortcomings, he had fear and embarrassment. But only trusting in God, he went on He went on an adventurous journey, risking his own life. In the next session, we'll talk about the events following his arrival in Egypt. Let me conclude the message. Brothers and sisters, when Moses was sent to the Israelites to fulfill God's providence, God proved that he was a man of God, not just with words, but through accompanying signs. As people saw All that Moses said fulfilled and witnessed manifestations of power which were impossible by man, no one could deny that the living God was with him. To bring them out of Egypt, there must have been, there should have been a leader like Moses. The Israelites prayed earnestly to God and God answered them, but without a leader like Moses, they wouldn't have been able to get out of Egypt and conquer Canaan. It's the same to us. In this harsh and dark world, we have to go down the spiritual path, not the fleshly path. We have to go down the path of faith. Can you walk down that path alone? No. We should need, we need a spiritual leader, a shepherd, A true shepherd. That's why we should choose a right true shepherd. The first thing God did to bring them out of Egypt was to select a leader. And he called Moses. You know, do you want to go out of Egypt and go into the uh, blessed land? And also it's important to uh, go through the, endure the 40 years of trial well. And we should think whether something is God's will or not. And we have to choose God's will. Just remember what kind of... You know, the Israelites had argument among themselves. They had selfish desire and greed. It's the same. And we can think whether someone is... So... we are saved by the Lord's cross but in order to enter heaven it's important for us to select a true shepherd and to obey and follow his teachings that's how we enter the blessed land of Canaan I explained uh, what kind of trials that leader goes through and what is the evidence of someone being with God. And if you choose a true shepherd, not just if you have that evidence, 
You have to obey even when things don't agree with their thoughts. You know, the Israelites try to argue with Moses. That's why they continually went through trials. The Bible says, Then the Lord said to Moses, See, I make you as God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron shall be your prophet. Through the tremendous power guaranteed by God, Moses was like God to the Israelites as well as to Pharaoh. Even to this day, the people of Israel has, have extremely honored the name of Moses and highly respected him. Like this, God lifts up and exalts his people. Deuteronomy chapter 18 verse 22 tells us how we can check whether someone's word spoken in the name of God is true. When a prophet speaks in the name of God, if the thing does not come about or come true, That is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You shall not be afraid of him. God sent Moses 3,400 years ago and delivered the Israelites out of Egypt. Also, generations after generation, God has sent individuals with his evidences to save his people. Even today, when the world is pitch dark spiritually, Father God wants to lead His people through individuals who have no self and completely obey. God bestows His power on such men of God and have them proclaim Him and lead numerous souls from Egypt, the world, into Canaan, flowing with milk and honey, which is heaven. I ask that you figure out Father God's providence for this church and the world in this same time and march on and conquer Canaan with more perfect faith. Since you've seen and experienced numerous works of power and heard the secrets of the spiritual realm, your final destination shouldn't be just heaven, but its most beautiful place, New Jerusalem. If you have such faith, you are more than able to overcome any problems lying before us with faith and trust. I pray in our Lord's name that the messages on the conquest of Canaan will lead you to the, take the land of Canaan both spiritually and physically and enjoy blessings from the land flowing with milk and honey. Hallelujah! Almighty Father God of love, please lay your hands on all brothers and sisters receiving this prayer here in attendance. Lay your hands on all the members of the brain churches and local centuries, and all the GCN TV viewers, and those who are watching via satellites, cables, and the internet all over the world, transcending space and time. Plant faith in their hearts and drive out their negative thoughts and doubts. Let all the trials and afflictions leave them. By the fire of the Holy Spirit, from head to toe, scorch their sick and affected parts, including all cells, tissues and nerves, all internal organs and intestines. Let the light of creation come upon them. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I command the enemy devil and Satan, all diseases, germs and viruses, and infirmities, go away. Let the light shine on them. scorch their incurable and long-term diseases by the fire of the Holy Spirit. Burn all kinds of endemic and contagious diseases like malaria. Be cleansed and made well. All epidemic diseases such as colds and fever go away from them. Protect them from any kinds of germs and viruses and bacteria. Heal them of all kinds of cancers like stomach cancer, lung cancer, liver cancer, breast cancer, womb cancer, intestinal cancer, and all other diseases like AIDS, leukemia, cerebral apoplexy, high blood pressure, low blood pressure, heart disease, lung disease, diabetes, women's diseases, thyroid diseases, and all inflammations. Let them be made whole from polio, stroke, arthritis, herniated discs, and many others. Let all kinds of pains disappear from them, like back pain, headache, and neuralgia. Set them free from epilepsy, autism, depression, neurosis, and all other mental diseases. Loosen them from all kinds of paralysis, and let them get up, walk, and jump. 
Let them regain good eyesight and restore good hearing. Let the blind open their eyes and the deaf come to hear and mute begin to speak. Heal them of after effects of all kinds of accidents. Restore their ruptured and broken bones. Restore them from burns and let the heat and burning sensation go away from them. Father, let there be no scars left. Be cleansed from all kinds of drug addictions and poisoning. Father, regenerate dead nerves, tissues and cells and bring the dead back to life. Father, please bless them to conceive a baby. Bless them to conceive a baby. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I command the enemy devil and Satan, the ruler of the air, the evil forces and their servants, go away from them. Go away, you evil spirits, unclean spirits, deceiving spirits, spirits of falsehood, separating spirits and all forces of darkness. Loosen all bones of wickedness and darkness and go away from them. Let the light shine on them. Father God, give them strength to cry out in their prayer and empower them with the power to cast off sins and become sanctified. Let them be in good health as their soul becomes prosperous and let their family be evangelized. Protect them from all kinds of accidents and disasters and bless them to lead a successful and prosperous life in everything. Please protect your children, their home, their business and their work by the fiery hedge of the Holy Spirit with the heavenly host and angels and with your blazing eyes. Give students wisdom and understanding and fill their hearts with more passion and desire for study. Keep their hearts and minds from worldly things and plant into their hearts more fervent love for God. Bless your children and let them give glory to you in everything they do, whether they eat or drink or whatever they do. Let them confess and testify to the living God, I've met God, I've experienced God, and received His answers and blessings. Father God, thank you. Let all glory be to you alone. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen.